Welcome to Little Lectures, making learning and teaching easy for residents and students on the go. Join our residents from the University of Louisville as they share the highest yield internal medicine topics in digestible chunks. Hello, uh, my name is Jordan Berlin. I am a third year medical resident at the University of Louisville Hospital. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about GI bleeds. This is gonna be part one of a two part series discussing GI bleeds. Today we'll talk about upper GI bleeds. So in defining upper GI bleeds, we like to talk about the location anatomically uh, that the lesion is uh, that is causing the bleed. So anything above the ligament of trites is considered an upper GI bleed. Thinking of it in that kind of way, when a patient presents with an upper GI bleed, the most common presenting symptoms or signs is going to be discussing about with these patients melana, hematochesia, or uh, hematemesis. If you notice hematochesia on a patient that you are concerned for an upper GI bleed, this is a significant bleed, very brisk bleed, needs probably more acute attention. So a patient who presents with an upper GI bleed will have signs and symptoms. They'll be complaining of epigastric pain, dyspepsia commonly, uh, sometimes with syncope, presyncope, these patients will also present again with vomiting potentially and then complaining of blood per rectum. Other things that you're going to want to note uh, are on physical exam for these patients is any concern for a cirrhotic picture, patients with spider angiomas, gynecomastia, patients who have ascites or jaundice. The other things that you're going to want to watch out for uh, in these patients is any history that you get of NSAID use, again, if they tell you that they're a cirrhotic or if they've had a history of peptic ulcer disease. The labs that you're gonna wanna look for when you have somebody who comes in with a upper GI bleed are your CBC, your CMP, your INR, and the reason that you're getting these is for the CBC, you wanna look at the hemoglobin. In the first 24 hours of a GI bleed, you might have falsely elevated or normal hemoglobin because it has not caught up to the acute bleed going on. Your platelets would be low. This is concerning for a cirrhotic and you would want to replace platelets as well if they're less than 50. The target hemoglobin level for these patients is anything less than seven you would like to transfuse. There has been several studies demonstrating that a higher transfusion goal has not actually provided better outcomes for these patients in either morbidity or mortality. For your CMP, you're looking at kinds of signs and symptoms. Again, cirrhosis, elevated LFTs, bilirubin. Uh, you want to make sure that any electrolyte arrangements are addressed. Uh, and then the INR for your patients who you're going to try and intervene on, you want the uh, INR less than two, preferably uh, in most cases. So for the patients that uh, you're concerned for these GI bleeds, the question now is, how do you treat? What do you do to help these patients? And so first and foremost, you get two large bore IVs uh, in place so that you can adequately resuscitate them. Uh, you want to type and cross these patients to be able to transfuse them again to a, whenever their hemoglobin reaches less than seven. You will want to start a protonic strip and then in your patients who are cirrhotic or you're concerned for cirrhosis, octreotide and ceftriaxone. The octreotide is to help with constriction of the splanchnic vasculature, decreasing bleed. And then the ceftriaxone is for possible infection in your cirrhotic patients. This reduces risk of infection and complication. Other things that you will want to do at this point is if the patient needs pressure support, be able to have access to start that. These patients need to be monitored very closely and you want to continue trending the hemoglobin somewhere in the range of every four to six hours in the initial bleed setting. The other things that you're going to want to consider is what's definitive treatment for these patients. And so definitive treatment uh, entails getting an EGD. EGD allows you to assess and look, take a look for any sources of bleeding that you're concerned about and potentially act on it. If you have a peptic ulcer, you would be able to inject, stop the bleed, clip the bleed. Uh, if you had an esophageal varicy, uh, you could band it, have more definitive treatment there. If there is concern about the size of the bleed, it's uncontrolled 
during EGD, then you would talk about surgical intervention, perhaps even IR intervention to embolize the lesion. If you do the EGD and you do not find a specific source and the patient continues to have drop in hemoglobin, continues to have bleed, uh, you could perform a red blood cell tag scan to look for any source of bleed. If this is not effective, you could consider a CT angiogram or the gold standard uh, actual angiography. Thinking about the etiologies of upper GI bleed, your most scary or most severe GI bleeds are gonna be your peptic ulcers and your esophageal varices. These need intervention quickly and you need definitive treatment. The other etiologies that you will see are Borhoff syndrome, Mallory Weiss tears, esophagitis, gastritis, duodenitis. Uh, you can also see issues with obviously cancers, so your esophageal cancers, stomach cancers. So in review of our discussion on upper GI bleeds, the three most important things to remember for these patients is you want to get a great history detailing history of cirrhosis, NSAID use, or history of peptic ulcer disease. The second most important thing is your physical exam, looking at the vital stability of the patient. Is this person who is incredibly sick, who needs more aggressive treatment and higher level of care? And the third thing to kind of consider with these patients is treatment. So for your patients you'll who have upper GI bleed, every single one of them is gonna need a pro protonic strip or protonics treatment, either IV in either case. And if you have a cirrhotic patient, making sure that they are on ictreotide and ceftriaxone. Thank you so much for taking your time listening to this lecture. I hope that it was helpful and I, I hope that you look forward to upcoming lectures. Thanks for listening and learning with us. If you would like more information on this topic, please take a look at our full-size Louisville Lectures, either on louisvillelectures.org, on our YouTube channel, or on our podcast. Just say oh. thank you. Yeah, just say thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>